Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, November 29th, 2020. We trust you had a blessed Thanksgiving, and God knows how much, how very much we have to be thankful for, even in these days of pandemic. Uh, we thank God. We thank him for all that he's done, what he's doing, and for what he's yet promised to do. We are still in Unit 3 which is entitled Godly Love Among Believers. Godly Love Among Believers. Our lesson from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, our lesson title rather, is A Community of Equals. A Community of Equals. Devotional reading is taken from Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Our background scripture James, the epistle of James, or letter of James, chapter 2, and our printed or lesson passage is James, chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Our key verse is, hearken from the King James Version, hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. That is James chapter 2, verse 5. Our lesson aims from the quarterly are, number one, understand the difference between showing partiality and treating others equally. Number two, affirm that all people are equally valued and loved by God. And number three, practice James's call to fulfill the royal law of loving one's neighbor as one's self. The lesson uh, has three major divisions after the introduction. The first is entitled The Problem, and that's covered between James chapter 2, verses 1 and 4. Second is the study, a study in contrast that's covered between verses five and seven. And the last is violating God's law. And that's covered between verses eight and 13. From the standard commentary, our lesson title is impartial love, impartial love. Very quickly, some additional aims are, number one, identify specific behaviors that demonstrated the church's underlying partiality. Number two, explain how following Jesus' command to love should have prevented Christians from showing favoritism. And then number three, discuss practices of his or her church that may discriminate against certain types of individuals and develop a plan to correct those actions. Amen, amen. I uh, want to make a few brief comments before we uh, get into a bit of background uh, and then into our lesson. Um, you know, from uh, from antiquity, uh, we have, uh, it has been very, very common for people to associate wealth and material blessings with God's favor. Uh, uh, they did in uh, at the time of James, when James wrote this epistle to, to the early church, uh, and they do today. Uh, and this is despite the fact that God has demonstrated uh, that he is... Uh, not partial to the rich or the poor. Uh, of course, he, those who are poor, as we'll see as we get into our lesson text, are generally more rich in faith than those who are rich, who depend on their riches uh, rather than on God in many instances. Uh, but we have uh, associated, again, someone doing well materially with God blessing them. Uh, certainly God is blessing them, but with his favor on them as opposed to someone who is more destitute, uh, struggling perhaps financially, uh, we sometimes think, well, they must be doing something wrong. You know, there's an old uh, old phrase we use, you know, when you see someone doing well, you must be living right. You know, well, 
that contradicts uh, the teachings of the Bible. Uh, we know God blessed the rich and the poor uh, throughout the pages of the Bible. Another another point I wanted to make is one of the commentator uh, starts out giving a definition of discrimination, discrimination, and and it's all uh, negative. Uh, he defines it as something negative uh, entirely, when in fact it isn't. Discrimination is a noun that must be modified by an adjective to give it real meaning. Uh, to discriminate. Uh, simply means to to choose between or to decide uh, between. It is uh, distinguishing between, uh, uh, maybe finally distinguishing between two items or actions. Uh, and we are told to be discriminating in some instances, to choose the good rather than evil. To be able to discern the difference between good and evil is the act of discriminating. What makes it something negative is when we add an adjective, a modifier, such as racial discrimination or ethnic discrimination or a sexual discrimination. Uh, we make it uh, something negative when we do that. And of course, God forbids that. God wants us to treat all equally uh, as he does. Uh, as, as again, uh, we'll see uh, God is uh, not a respecter of person. There's no partiality in God. Now, um, the way of background, uh, this uh, epistle written by James uh, was written to the, well, first of all, James, this James was the half-brother of Jesus and certainly could have introduced himself uh, to give um, more weight, of course, to uh, who he was, uh, one of the early um, uh, leaders in the church, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, but he simply defines himself as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ in James chapter 1, verse 1. And he is writing to the 12 tribes of Israel scattered abroad, or the diaspora. And uh, many believe he's writing to those particularly who are believers in Christ that are of the 12 tribes, wherever they may be. Uh, and they may, uh, some were scattered, of course, by the uh, uh, cap captivities, uh, the Assyrian captivity of the Northern Kingdom in 722. And then the Babylonian captivity, uh, ultimately culminating in 596 BC, uh, uh, sorry, 586 BC, uh, and uh, but he is writing to what the Jews wherever they are. And again, I I think those who have been introduced to Christ uh, as the Messiah, as the Savior, and he is going to touch on something that. Perhaps um, he had noticed in the early church something that comes directly out of the world and is uh, pretty characteristic of our human nature, and that is to show partiality or racial or ethnic or other discrimination uh, toward one another. Uh, and so uh, as we go through the lesson Let's examine ourselves. You know, I know we know not to discriminate. Uh, however, we have to resist the natural tendency to do that. You know, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to overrule our nature and our natural inclination to discriminate when we see uh, two people. Uh, we have no idea what their characters are whether they're good or evil, but discriminating on the basis of uh, wealth or stature or uh, any any standard other than uh, uh, the, the content of the character, as Dr. Martin Luther King said. So with that, let's, uh, let's take a look at our first passage. Um, again, this first division is entitled The Problem, James chapter 2 verses 1 to 4, and I'm going to read from the 
Uh, I'm going to read from the NIV today. Uh, he says, my brothers and sisters, believe believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, before before I go on, I did want to uh, look at a couple of uh, scriptures. Uh, one from the at least one from the Old Testament and another from uh, the New Testament that uh, clearly give us God's um, uh, instruction on how we are to not be partial or show any kind of injustice. Let's go, let's take a look at uh, Leviticus chapter. And we know throughout the Old Testament, God uh, speaks of how um, his people are to provide for the poor, or they're not to glean the corners of the field and so forth. And the year of Jubilee uh, and then in the seventh year, how the slaves are to be uh, freed and so forth. Uh, but Let's look at uh, Leviticus uh, chapter 19, verse 15. There we find, it says, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. Okay, so that's from Leviticus. So, uh, the long before the first advent of Christ, the Israelites knew God's feeling about impar partiality and injustice. Well, let's also take a look at uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 25 in particular, but let's back up to 23. And it reads, and I'm reading from the New King James, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. There is no partiality. There is no partiality with God. And that's from Romans 2.11, which reads, For there is no partiality with God. So as we uh, begin our lesson, uh, let's do it with the understanding of how God feels about partiality and how God feels about prejudice. Uh, okay, uh, at least on the basis of wealth or ethnic uh, distinctions or racial distinctions. All right. Now, now God makes a distinction certainly between sinners and uh, those who are righteous or trying to live righteous lives. And that is really uh, the only basis that God makes decisions on those who are who have accepted uh, the payment that his son made for their sins and those who have not. So let's back up to verse one. And again, it says, my brothers and sisters, believe in. Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Again, uh, we've defined what well favoritism is, uh, tending to favor someone or uh, uh, to show favor to someone on the basis of uh, something other than uh, what is warranted. It does mean to prejudge. It, this is where uh, prejudice comes in uh, to uh, on on the basis of appearance, uh, and it, uh, it it has nothing to do with uh, the content of a person's character or whether one uh, is an evil person or uh, uh, a relatively good person. Uh, it is something that is basically a distinction made by class or by category. 
And he is telling that he's saying that those who truly serve, believe uh, the Lord Jesus Christ must not, that's an imperative, must not show favoritism, must not be respecters of persons. And that is, again, because God is not, God has commanded us not to be. Now, beginning of verse 2, James gives a hypothetical, which, you know, may be something that he's actually experienced. And certainly uh, we can imagine something like this happening, not only in the early church, but in today's church. He says in verse 2, suppose a man comes into your meeting or your assembly or your worship service wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in wealth in filthy old clothes also comes in. So the man comes in wearing uh, expensive jewelry and fine clothes, obviously demonstrating uh, that he is wealthy, that he is a, a person of some material substance. Uh, and um, you obviously see this and and notice it. He comes and uh, of course a. Another person comes, and that's all you notice, by the way, okay? Uh, that this uh, man is apparently uh, has some financial means. And then you also notice a poor man comes in with filthy clothes. Uh, and uh, again, hypothetical, but not beyond our stretch of imagination at all. Verse 3 says, if you show attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you. But you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. And you can imagine uh, how a wealthy person, and, and let's assume these are both unbelievers. You have no idea who they are. They're strangers uh, and assume to both be just perhaps uh, curious uh, seekers, okay? They come in and you, you don't know anything else about them. Uh, there may be a tendency for the ushers or deacons or whoever is serving in the church and greeting uh, to think that, hey, the wealthy person can do something for us. You know, if we get this wealthy person to become a part of our fellowship, our congregation. He can contribute and he can help us. He can do something for us. And so we're going to give him a, the best seat in the house so he can see everything that's going on. Uh, and we're going to kowtow to him uh, however we can uh, to impress him. Uh, whereas the, the man with the filthy clothes obviously uh, is destitute. Uh, is certainly um, has uh, no means and, and probably needy. And you can imagine perhaps uh, church officials saying, well, we know this is the last person we need is somebody else that's going to be a drain on our resources. And, and I'm just, this is all hypothetical, but you can imagine it happening. And no one would certainly mouth this, but you can imagine uh, thoughts, these thoughts, uh, being thought, uh, and uh, and and this is what James is talking about. You know, if you, if you, and of course the thoughts are obviously direct the actions towards both men. You tell the you, you're really not concerned about the poor man where he stands, or how good of uh, a vantage he has on the services. So you see, position him in the back. In fact, you probably don't want him in a prominent place because he he may uh, be an embarrassment uh, for you uh, and for uh, others who have some means. And so you put him in a less prominent place uh, um, and, and uh, perhaps a place of dishonor even. Verse 4, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, when he said discriminated here, he is talking about discriminated in an evil way. Have you not prejudged? Have you not shown favoritism? The King James reads, are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts, or judges with evil thoughts. And, and actually, that is what determines the partiality, the evil thinking that, that's a remnant of the world or the natural man, the pattern of thinking 
that they developed when they walked as natural men. It's the pattern that we developed when we walked as natural men before we were transformed. It's natural for the world to do that. We see that in corporate settings. We see it in social settings. We see where those type of discriminations are made, uh, pre prejudices are exhibited uh, uh, throughout, uh, in the courts, uh, throughout our society. We see it. But we are not to see this in the church. You know, the Lord Jesus said in Matthew um, 15, verse 19, he says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. You know, the, it's the pattern of thinking. This uh, prejudice is, is rooted in the heart of the natural man, uh, which God said is, I mean, uh, Jeremiah said, is deceitfully wicked. He said, who can know it? it? It's deceitful above all things. It is desperately wicked. Who can know it? When we become a part of the body of Christ, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to replace that thinking with the mind of Christ uh, from Philippians chapter 2. So whether that thinking is uh, commonplace in the world or not, it has no place and should have no place in the body of Christ. Let's move on to division two of our lesson, um, which is entitled A Study in Contrast. And let's read verses five to seven from the NIV again. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him, but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? Now, backing up to verse 5, um, and again, it reads, listen, dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Now, we know throughout the Old Testament, God uh, has uh, shown in various ways, expressed in various ways, uh, how he has chosen the poor. And we don't have time to go to these verses right now, but uh, when you have a, a chance, look at Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22, Zechariah, verse 7, I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 10. Uh, and, and, and let's just take a look at uh, Deuteronomy 15, 11. And it, and it reads, For the poor will never cease from the land, Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide uh, to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. God, there's, a, there, there's been a special place in God's heart demonstrated throughout the Old Testament for the widows and the orphans. He's commanded uh, his people to care for them. In fact, he's judged them because they have not cared for them. Uh, that is one of the sins recounted over and over again before the captivities uh, of both the northern and southern kingdoms. Uh, and so God has chosen them rich in faith. Now, why are they rich in faith? Those who are destitute of material wealth and means to provide and care for themselves are generally more inclined to trust God for those things. They realize that uh, they are nothing, they have nothing, and they can do nothing apart from God. And that is the true definition of humility. I've said this many times in my Sunday school class. The true definition of humility is recognizing our standing, our station before an almighty and all-powerful God. We are nothing, we have nothing, and we can do nothing apart from him. Contrary to the rich who believe that by virtue of their wealth, they have some power, they have some means to 
provide for themselves, to protect themselves, to to do this, that, or the other. And you should read the parable that Jesus gave about the rich man and Lazarus. And we won't go take the time to go there, but we know how that uh, how that story ended. Uh, but they are inclined to be deceived by their wealth, by their riches in believing that they have no need that they can't provide for themselves. The rich and the poor, however, understand that they are needy, understand that they are destitute without God. And that's why in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus said, blessed are the poor, the poor in spirit. And we are all to be poor in spirit, regardless of our financial means or how God has blessed us materially. We are to recognize the poverty that we, we came to the cross with in spirit. Verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Now, when 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 James says that they are dishonoring, um, uh, the King James says despise the poor. Uh, it really means um, the def the deferential treatment that they give to the rich. They're honoring the rich and and. Uh, in counter distinction, they're dishonoring the poor uh, by treating them as second class or lower class uh, citizens or members, in this case, of the assembly or the congregation. Uh, and again, we're assuming these are visitors, so n n uh, no one knows anything about their character. They're only they're they're judging, prejudging them on their appearance only. One. Uh, apparently uh, appearing to be rich, rich, and the other poverty-stricken. And James also uh, makes a point of mentioning something that was probably commonly known. It was characteristics. Not, not this was not universal in every case, but characteristics of the rich to oppress the poor. In fact, in many cases, that's how they became rich. Uh, we can think of today, you know, slum landlords and people that get rich. Uh, uh, really by mistreating the poor. Uh, and of course, when uh, the poor were taken to court, uh, you know, they had to depend, well, today, I don't know what they had uh, at the time James wrote this epistle in terms of uh, public defenders, but today we have uh, public defenders, but the wealthy, of course, can hire the best lawyers and make a case and certainly bribe uh, the, the, the court or the judge or whoever to, to make sure that uh, any judgments are in their favor. That is still true today, unfortunately. Uh, we, we, we like to think that it's a lot better, and perhaps it is, but uh, if, if it came to the wealthy and the poor uh, coming to uh, court to, for some uh, rendering of justice, uh, the the... The wealthy, one of the comments is, were, were, were virtually invincible when it came to those types of controversies. So they were going to win out. And they were, uh, of course, uh, lording it over the poor in, in more ways than, than we can imagine at this point. Verse 7 reads, Do not, I'm sorry, it says, Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him whom, to whom you belong. Now we we know this word blasphemed uh, is elsewhere in the Bible uh, is is uh, translated reviled. It can mean to defame, um, and it doesn't always have to have a religious connotation or overtone. Uh, sometimes it just means to uh, to dishonor. Uh, it means. Uh, uh, and, 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 and that is what the rich are doing. They are um, in exploiting the poor. They are dishonoring uh, the name of Christ. Uh, and uh, they're doing contrary to what God has commanded them to do, what God has clearly taught. Again, going back to the Old Testament and what God uh, does himself wants us to imitate. So in summary, their, their treatment of the poor is, um, is an insult to the worthy name of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, let's take a look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. And, and we know this is, is summarizing a passage where we are commanded to have the mind of Christ uh, in sh uh, um, demonstrating our humility or mimicking, if you will, or his humility. And verse 9 um, uh, begins the summary. It says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue is going to confess. Rich and poor are going to confess. God's want, God wants us to recognize uh, that we are all uh, uh, his, his, his subjects. We are all uh, going to be uh, humbled. We're all going to be confessing the name of Jesus. And so again, um, by exploiting the poor, uh, they are uh, presuming to be something other than what they they will be, uh, uh, be demonstrated to be in the end. So let's move into our final uh, division here, um, which is entitled Violating God's Law, verses 8 to 13. Again, from the NIV, verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whosoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you should shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. And verse 13, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So, back up to verse 8. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. And that royal law comes from Leviticus 19.18. Uh, uh, and it is a royal law um, on two levels or for two reasons. You know, first... It is the king's law, the one that controls and orders all things we should do. The king of the universe, the Lord, the sovereign of the universe, uh, which is God. He is the giver of that law. And then second, uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The first is it is the king of laws. It is the most important of the laws, and that is to love. Uh, we are commanded to love one another as ourselves, love others rather, as ourselves. And we know this is the second great commandment. The first is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's, and to love others as ourselves. And that's from the Shema, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning at verse 4. And so th the first is it is the king of law, most uh, important of all laws, the summation of the law, uh, Jesus uh, declares in Matthew chapter 22, uh, beginning at verse 27, 27 to 40. But it is it is a royal law also because of the, the one who gave it being the sovereign uh, of the universe, the sovereign ru ruler and sustainer of the universe. That is what makes it the royal law. Again, what is Paul, I mean, sorry, what is James saying? He says, if you really keep the royal law, that is, you love others as yourself in Scripture, you are doing right. He's saying, definitely, you're doing the right thing. But, verse 9 says, if you show favoritism, 
you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. Now, James has already given, or actually he's about to give an example of how uh, if you break the law in one point, you are guilty of all. You are a lawbreaker. There's no partial keeping of the law and being righteous by virtue of the law or your keeping of the law. So he says, if you show favoritism, you sin. He is declaring this to be a sin. And there uh, are many, many, many verses throughout Scripture that say the same thing, that uh, God is not partial. God has commanded us not to show favoritism and, and to be impartial. Now, he says, and, and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. Now, we've talked, um, or at least we've talked in our Sunday school classes about the purpose of the law. The principal purpose of the law is not to save us. It is to show us our sinful condition. Just as a mirror shows us dirt on our face, the law is to show us our sin. The sin is not removed by the law. It is simply uh, exposed by the law. The sin is removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, we, and it is removed when we embrace what Jesus Christ, when we accept what Jesus Christ did on the cross as payment for our sins. Now, verse 10 says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. In other words, as I said, no partial keeping of the law. And he says this partiality or this favoritism is breaking the law. So they are transgressors of the law when they dishonor the poor and they favor or show deference to the rich. Let's look at verses 10 and 11 together. I'm sorry, let's look at 11 rather. Um, for he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. In other words, we don't pick and choose which laws we're going to keep and declare ourselves righteous because we haven't broken certain laws. We are guilty uh, of being lawbreakers if we break any law. Now, the only one who was righteous under the law was Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ, and the only one able to bear our sins on the cross, the perfect lamb without blemish, without sin, was Jesus Christ. And Jesus asked those uh, of his day to convict him of sin. Which of you, he, de he declared, convicts me of sin? He was completely without sin, the only one righteous under the law, and the only one able to bear the sins of those who had committed sins under the law. And that is each and every human being, beginning with Adam, even before the law. The command that God gave him, he broke. The only one that God gave him, he and Eve broke. Uh, now, um, so verse 12 says, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Um, from the King James, it says, So speak ye, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. This law of liberty, um, uh, it's it's... One of the commentators says uh, it's the other foundational ethic that runs throughout this chapter. Love frees us to keep God's commands rather than constraining us with the commands. Uh, this love, we are to love others again, the royal law, as ourselves, and it frees us to keep God's command. It does not constrain us. Uh, uh, these commands do not constrain us. Uh, in, 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 instead of trying to uh, prevent us from uh, destructive actions, 
uh, it actually encourages us to act in life-affirming ways, this commentator says, ultimately beneficial for us and others involved, uh, other involved parties. So we are freed to love. We are freed from our natural inclinations to uh, follow the world's pattern, to demonstrate partiality, to prejudge, uh, to love one another, to accept one another uh, as God does. Uh, you know, the, God said in, in John three sixteen, for God so loved the world, not meaning the world system, but those in the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't say there was no qualification of the whoever, whoever simply means that whoever, and that is the way we are to receive one another. And certainly, if we're going to show any uh, favoritism at all, we are to, as Galatians chapter 5 tells us, we are to, to, to pay particular attention to the needs of those who are of the household of faith. Not to say that we are not to address the needs of, of all, the unsaved world and all. Jesus told us we are to love our enemies even, but we are to pay particular attention to the needs of those who are of the household of faith. I believe that's uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 10. So just, just to sum up on this verse, this law of liberty frees us from the discrimination uh, our society encourages, uh, but that God does not tolerate. Okay, that, that's what we want to take away from this. Uh, we don't want to discriminate on any basis uh, that man uh, decides to divide uh, himself uh, by. Let's move on to verse 13. And from the uh, NIV again, it says, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, um, you know, one of the commentators uh reflects on the Lord's prayer, the model prayer that the Lord gave in Matthew chapter 6, uh, particularly verses 14 and 15, uh, which really cautions us uh, not about not uh, forgiving one another uh, and uh, from the heart. Uh, and we don't, uh, we don't do that uh, to gain God's mercy. We don't show mercy to others to gain God's mercy. We, we, we do it uh, uh, out of a, a response uh, to God's mercy. Um, you remember the parable that the Lord spoke uh, about the, uh, the ruler calling one of his servants to account uh, for what he had, uh, what he owed, and, and, uh, and it was a, a huge amount, and he could not possibly pay. So he was going to sell this uh, servant into slavery and his family, and, uh, and, the, and the servant fell down and, and begged him not to, and, and, the, and the Lord had mercy on him. Uh, and forgave him all the debt which he could not possibly pay, which is, uh, which is symbolic of our sin debt. And then the man went out and grabbed one of his fellow servants who owed him a fifty bucks, and ch and choked him and said, you know, pay me what you owe. And he and he, he said, hey, just have mercy on me and I'll pay you, which he could have done had the uh, fellow the servant given him time, but he had him cast into debtor's prison. And of course, this was made known to the Lord. And the Lord uh, then uh, uh, was enraged by the fact that the servant that he showed mercy to did not have mercy on his fellow servant. So what what is verse thirteen sh sh is telling? Uh, uh, what is ver verse thirteen telling us here? It says, "For again, because judgment, and this judgment means." Uh, discrimination in this case, okay, or discernment, okay, uh, without mercy. In other words, it, it's not it's not a prejudice that we are told to make distinctions. We are told to show uh, uh, prudence, to exercise judgment, but to judge righteously uh, without mercy. So the mercy is. Uh, 
you know, God, we, 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 we often speak of mercy and grace being opposite sides of the same coin. Mercy is God not giving us the punishment that we justly deserve. Grace is him giving, is his unmerited favor, him giving us what we don't deserve. Uh, now, when we show partiality, we are being merciless. We are not uh, giving anyone the benefit of the doubt. We are being prejudiced in our judgment uh, of uh, this person's character or uh, worth. Uh, and, and that is what is being uh, spoken of here. And so we are going to be judged, uh, and, and we know uh, we are going to be judged by the same measure that we judge others. And if we have not shown mercy to others, no mercy will be shown to us. And finally, he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. He wants mercy, and, and certainly it will in the lives of true believers, Mercy to win out in our lives and be shown in the ways we treat others. Uh, and uh, mercy, and so in this way, mercy will overrule judgment or prejudgment or partiality, uh, the inclinations to be partial or to prejudge. Now, as we close, I, I want us to examine ourselves and to be perfectly honest with ourselves. I know uh, sometimes we we often think we are uh, beyond certain sins, that we are uh, mature to a point where uh, we don't have these inclinations. But believe me, the natural man, we, we have uh, uh, a, uh, a war going on within us. Uh, we know the spirit is warring against our flesh within us and the natural man can rear his ugly head at any time with notions or with thoughts. Uh, and they may just be momentary, but we want to uh, at all times be uh, under the control of the, our minds. We want our minds to be under the control of the spirit. We want to, to have the mind of Christ and to think his mind. And when we, when we feel those inclinations to prejudge someone on the basis of appearance uh, or anything uh, other than a righteous standard, we want to quickly repent of those things and ask God's forgiveness and bring ourselves under the submission of the Holy Spirit. So with that, we thank, we thank God. And Lord, we, we just come before you thanking you for this privilege to study your precious word. Lord, we thank you for blessing us and keeping us in your care throughout this year. We thank you for allowing us to enjoy such fellowship as we were uh, on Thanksgiving. Uh, we thank you for keeping us in your loving care, Lord, even uh, throughout these days of pandemic, uh, throughout all the turmoil that's going on uh, throughout our nation and our world, Lord. We know that you're in control. And that you've, you, you've given us a peace that surpasses the understanding of this world. And you said you would keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. And we just trust, Lord, that all those who are hearing uh, this message today are trusting in you totally and completely. Recognizing, Lord, that, uh, again, you are fully in control. And that uh, you've promised, Lord, uh, to keep us in your loving care, Lord, to never leave us or forsake us. And, Lord, we, we pray again that you would help us to, to walk under the uh, control, to walk in the Spirit by the enablement of your Spirit, Lord, in everything that we do, even when it comes to our tendency uh, to imitate the world and show impartiality, Lord, in any area of our lives. We just thank and praise you for your word again, Lord. We pray that we'll be obedient to it. We pray that it will find roots in our heart and produce much precious fruit in our lives. It will redound to your praise and glory. In his Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. So until such time as we see you again, we pray that God would keep you in his loving care.